Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam brother. I've, I've got a really bad line. I can just barely about hear you. Uh, you could probably hear me anyway. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, two questions. Uh, one is related to the topic of Imam Raza Islam. Um, some Sufi orders claim the lineage back to Imam Raza Islam through um, a certain companion. I can't remember his name. Uh, is there any uh, confirmation to this that there's any particular Sufi system which stems its roots back to Imam Raza Islam? That's the first question. Okay, thank you. And your second question, brother? And topic actually is to uh, one of the companions of the Holy Prophet, may peace and blessings be upon him and his family. His name was Abdullah ibn Umar. And what is, I, I come across a tradition actually that's from an, uh, a particular reference from a, the brothers from another school, and it talks about how he gave allegiance to Yazid. Now, you know, some people say the companions did not support Yazid, um, and obviously we, uh, with the atrocities that took place in Karbala. So what I'd like to know is that, um, could Brother Omar uh, please uh, shed some light on, on this particular personality, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brother. Uh, in terms of the two questions, uh, we'll definitely answer the first one. I think we're going to have another show uh, regarding Karbala and Ashura. So we'll deal with the second one, inshallah. Uh, in fact, uh, obviously, Muharram coming up in a couple months. And inshallah, we'll have a show around that time to deal with that. Uh, in terms of the first question, um, there were some Sufi orders, the Brother said, who claim lineage to Imam al -Raza. Um How much truth is there to this? Yeah, there are, without a doubt, certain people who... Um, come from that Radawi line, um, who are Sadat, who were also part of Sufi Tariqas. There are even many Sufis who came to debate Imam Ali ibn Musa Radha alayhi salam when he was alive, that you find um, uh, a whole group of Sufis who came towards the Imam and said to him that uh, you live in a life where you have luxury and you have pomp and a true pious leader would never have you know the number of clothes that you have and the luxury couches that you have and he replied back to them prophet yusuf alayhi salam again was a prophet of god yet he sat on the best of couches and he had the best of mosque so you find that there are people today who trace their lineage back and who have taken on sufi tariqas and i just want to tie into that point because we have a lot of people who sometimes associate religion with uh, a hardcore asceticism and obviously, there's a lot of respect for the people who take the path of asceticism. But from the examples you've given, is it not true to say that there's nothing wrong with perhaps, you know, enjoying uh, things in life and Allah has given you things in life to enjoy them as long as they're within the remits and the limits of the Sharia and of the limits of Islam? Well, you know, a famous, um, uh, you know, uh, quote which you can use is live in this world, <coughs> but don't let the world live in you. Yeah. You as a human being have been created to achieve perfection in this world. The world is a means for you either being successful or unsuccessful. Sometimes Muslims have this idea that anyone who is successful in terms of wealth, that's a person who's a worldly person. And sometimes you even hear people who say that Imam Ali salam, was anti the world and he would say the world is like a snake or the world is poisonous and so on. Imam Ali salam, when he attacked the world or attacked the pleasures of this dunya, it was only after certain caliph was, um, was distributing the money of the Muslims in a very extravagant way to his own family members. Whereas before that, Imam Ali salam, constantly tells the people, use this world as a means for you to achieve perfection. Even Imam al-Jawad was once asked about the importance of using musk, for example. Imam al-Jawad said, my father, Imam Ali ibn Musa salam, would spend 700 dirhams on a particular musk taken from a particular tree. And he'd keep asking that I want a mosque from that tree only. So it goes to show that here Imam Ali ibn Musa was showing that, you know, looking after your cleanliness, looking after your health, your wealth, is not a sign of worldliness. If you're using this world, you're living in it, but you don't let it live in you. That's a very important statement to be understood. Live in this world. Enjoy of what God's given you in this world. But don't let the world live in you in a situation where it overtakes everything in your life. You know, um... And you know, a big test for any human being to test how much the world's affected them, that which you have in your life, how much are you willing to give it away? If you want to hog it and not give it away, that means that that's overtaken you. Whereas if you're willing to give it away, then as the Quran says, you'll never achieve righteousness until you give away that which you love.
we've been able to give away a signed Arsenal shirt. So, <laughs> um, so I do believe we have a live caller. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, brother. Salam. Brother, I can't hear you very well. Um, but if I am on air, I'll just ask you the question. Um, my question is, Imam Ali Rizal, while he was traveling through Nishapur, he um, stated um, a hadith, a Qudsi, where it was related by the golden chains to Hazrat Jibreel, Jibreel Islam, to Allah, that um, uh, the kalama, la ilaha illallah, is, uh, is my fort. And he who enters my fort is safe from my punishment. And then the Imam went a bit further on, and he said, I am one of the conditions of the kalama. Um, but it has its conditions, and I am one of the conditions. And I was wondering if the Sayyid could explain what the Imam meant by that. And secondly, if you can still hear me, um, my question is, you were talking about um, Dibble um, earlier, and the poetry itself, that was a very good topic. Um, I wanted to ask um, some of the poets, they actually, because it's essential in their work to, for the listeners to empathize with the human feeling of, say, Imam Hussein in the Battle of Karbala, what they actually sometimes relay is not completely historic, and people therefore say that they shouldn't be invited to the pulpit because it's not strictly historic. For example, Imam Hussein would, um, how he felt on the martyrdom of Hazrat Ali Akbar al Islam. Um, but the Imams um, previously seemed to sanction that by having these poets. Okay, I can't hear you at all, so that's my question. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, brother. Very good call. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions there. The first one um, dealing with the hadith, and this is actually a hadith which I've read and was of great interest to me, which is that the Imam says, as the brother mentioned on his journey to Nishapur, uh, La ilaha illallah is the fort of Allah, and I am one of the conditions of this fort. And the brother wanted you to just expand on that. Well, definitely the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are a condition in understanding the very meaning of there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a number of different levels. On the first level that they are those who are able to provide you with the interpretation of the Book of Allah and the way Rasul Allah protected the revelation of the Book of Allah. As in when we call them Imams, what are we trying to state? We are stating that Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, his role was to ensure that the revelation of the Quran was smooth and gradual over a 23 year period explained to the people. The Imams are the protectors of the interpretation of the Quran so that the Qur'an does not become given in the wrong hands and interpreted by any Tom, Dick and Harry. You have people who have been endowed with knowledge who are able to protect the meaning of the Qur'an. Because later on, you had certain people who came out with many different opinions on one particular verse of the Qur'an. These Imams are allowing us to understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they are endowed with the knowledge of that holy book. Number two, if we want to understand the manifestation of Allah's attributes on earth, there are no better exemplars on the earth than the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. You know, today we mention Imam al rida al rida isn't his name, it's his title. He is content mm. with what's being given. al jawad means generous. Mm. al kadhum means he who restrains his uh, anger at a time when he should be, um, you know, in a state of anger. You find that these attributes are attributes of the manifestation of God's mercy on earth. These people, when you look at the way they behave, they, you look at them, then you understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look at them, they are the embodiment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, of Allah's generosity on the earth. Mm -hmm. So when Imam says, we are one of the factors in understanding la ilaha illallah, on the first level, we are the ones who are endowed with the knowledge of the interpretation of the Quran. Number two, we are the ones who Allah has chosen as your guides on the earth. There were other Imams who were living at the time. But on the third level, their knowledge is that which is acquired. The Imams is that which is immediate. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between knowledge which is acquired and knowledge which is immediate. Acquired knowledge is fallible. Immediate knowledge where you are inspired by Allah to give answers towards the Ummah, that immediate knowledge is infallible knowledge. There are no errors in that knowledge. That knowledge is exactly how Rasulullah would have answered the question mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the brother had another question. We have a caller waiting on the line. I want to answer this question first and then sure. we'll go to the caller, uh, inshallah. The question was, again, regarding the poetry issue. And he said that, I believe this question was, sometimes, you know, you get people who come and they maybe, they say things which maybe don't really have a, a root in history or a source in history. And they may exaggerate a few things. 
So, you know, what should we do? Do we invite these people It's back? the role of the speaker that when he recites a piece of poetry in the lamentation part of his lecture, that he makes it clear it's as if the poet state. Mm. Or in the Arabic language, they say, Lisan al-Hal. Lisan al-Hal means um, it's as if this was their emotion had they been there and heard them say this particular line. Mm. So, for example, I remember once in one of my lectures where I said that I was talking about um, Ali al-Akbar's mother, Layla. And I said, had she seen what happened to her son, and she would have been present on the uh, 10th of Muharram, she would have said, and the poets say. Mm. Now, if I said she would have said, then I'm trying to make a direct quote to her. No. Mm. The poets say, this is what she would have said. Mm. And the poets say, for example, Oh Ali, the only consolation that I can take from your death is that I will now see you in my dreams. Mm -hmm. But for me to dream, I need to sleep. And I'll never sleep after the 10th of Muharram. Now that's not her words. Mm -hmm. That's a poet who's saying, I think Layla would have said this mm -hmm. had she seen what happened to Ali al-Akbar. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have some speakers who make their poetry sound like actual historical mm -hmm. evidence. And they have to make a clear divide between what is poetry and what is historical accuracy. But how much uh, poetic license do we give to the poets? I mean, where do we draw the line, as you mentioned? I mean, well, how much freedom do we actually give to poets? To well, as long as the poet isn't going outside the theological principles of the school, mm. then there is no harm in any poetry. Mm. As in, like, um, you don't want someone whose poetry completely contradicts the historical occasion. Mm. Nor do you want someone whose poetry is blasphemous. Mm. Uh, you want someone who, for example, tells you that, you know what, this is a mother, she's lost her son. Yeah. I believe that these are the types of emotions yeah. that were going through her at the time. Sure. And I hope the caller is still online. Salaamu Alaikum. Salaamu Alaikum. I wanted, I wanted to discuss this dua to the youths in particular years. That I was once speaking in another center in, in, in London. Different subject. I was not even speaking on Elijah Mumbala. And well, he, and then when I saw an alim, and he was dressed in, in, in his kaba and in his kaba and a black turban, so I knew he was a Sayyid. When he raised his hand, of course I gave him priority. But you see, we've got to be careful these times, because some of these people come in the wrong garb. He called himself a, a, a Shia Sayyid, and he questions me, he says, what do you say about that dua which starts Ilahi Abu Anbala? I will not detain you on that history in, in, in less than a minute. I'll finish this part of the story to come to the main point. He says, what do you say about that dua ilaya And I mentioned to him the authorities that I mentioned to you. I said, well, I regard that as authentic. The first book that comes to our mind is Mufatih al-Jinan. The Sheikh Abbas Kumi, Mufatih al-Jinan, has reported this from the 12th Imam alayhi salam. Fortunately, I remembered the account of uh, Allama Tabrisi alayhi rahma. Put that to him. Says, oh, oh, this is all, all uh, sheer fabrication. All this is not authentic because reciting this dua is shirk. And there is guna in it. I said, look, I, I cannot accept that at all. It, it, it's taught by an imam, salam, an imam who was sent by Allah to stop us from shirk. If there is anybody who will teach us to keep away from shirk, it will be him. He would not be doing the contrary. But I said, this is not my subject, it's not a matter for discussion now, and I will not permit you to take time with the audience <coughs> on that subject and cut him short. But I realize that there are agencies <coughs> within us who are promulgating this, and I thought we'd better make this clear. You can see from the first paragraph of this dua, it is a dua to Allah 